The opening tutorial section is one of the most important parts of any video game. You need to convey a lot of important information about how your game works and how players interact with it while not boring or frustrating anyone. If your tutorial is too slow or too long or interrupts the player too frequently, that could easily lead to closing the game and a bad review. There's lots of ways to tackle tutorial design, but for most projects, the best kind of tutorial is invisible. That means the player is being taught lessons through context, and that they are given specific rule teaching experiences during standard gameplay that can replace any pop-up text or cutscenes which would otherwise be needed. The downside of building an invisible tutorial is that it's really hard to execute well. All of the burden to teach players falls on level design, and there's a risk that without being explicit, some of these critical lessons might be missed. In this video, we're going to walk through how to build an effective, invisible tutorial through well-considered level design. I'll be using my project Scrabdackle as a case study, because I can accurately speak to what decisions were made and why. I'll also be showing the final tutorial zone map in this video, but we'll be talking through all the design goals and iterations that led to that final layout. Let's get started. For any tutorial to be effective, it has to be consciously designed around two things. One, the mandatory gameplay mechanics the player needs to learn, like how combat works, and two, the optional gameplay design concepts the player should learn if possible. We're going to list these out and call them the lesson plan. Each lesson on the plan needs to be accounted for in our tutorial. As we work through it, we might also discover more lessons that will need to be taught along the way, and we'll add them to the plan as we go. Let's start with the optional concepts, because that's what the game is about to me, and it's good to keep these in mind from the very beginning all the way through. I want this game to be based around a genuine feeling of exploration and adventure, and I want to quantify what that means, because just putting adventure in the title doesn't mean players will actually feel that way. To me this means that looking around is worthwhile, that you aren't told where to go, and that there's multiple routes to a given goal. I'm going to rephrase that first point to make it more objective, and instead of just saying that looking around is worthwhile, I'm going to say that exploration is tangibly rewarded. We'll come back to how we actually teach that later on. For the mandatory gameplay mechanics, we won't have as much choice in what needs to be taught. Every core mechanic that exists in the game must be taught as it is introduced, or the player will be left actively confused or frustrated. Let's not go through every mechanic in Scrapdackle and just focus on one, the combat system. We need to make sure to introduce the general offensive concept of shooting at enemies, like aiming and how your magic reserve drains and replenishes, so let's throw introductory combat scenario on the lesson plan. But we also need to teach some related defensive concepts, like that enemies will spot you and give chase from a certain distance, or that they can have specific telegraphs you can learn to understand when and how they will attack. So we'll also add exposure to enemy behavior. This is important to keep distinct from general combat, because if players have the ability to fight back, they won't notice or absorb the defensive lesson if it's combined with the offensive one. Finally, the combat system also extends to the way that save points replenish your health. Let's just note exposure to save points for now. The lesson plan is starting to look pretty bulky, and although I'm not going to touch on everything the level design tries to teach here, there's still one final constraint that every good tutorial should have. For anything that is mandatory to teach, the player should not be able to proceed until they've been exposed to that lesson. For an invisible tutorial, that usually means locking the player in the starting area until you can be sure they're ready to proceed. We've got our level design syllabus. Now let's try to actually structure what we want to teach in what order in the game. The mandatory lessons should come first, so let's figure out what makes sense to introduce in what order. I mentioned that it's good for players to not learn the offensive lesson at the same time as the defensive one, so let's make sure you're exposed to any behavior before you have the chance to fight back. One way to ensure this is by giving the player zero offensive abilities at the start of the game. I want to follow that line of thinking through. If offensive combat is the last mandatory lesson to teach, then the player should find the offensive ability at the end of the tutorial segment, and we can ensure the player can't exit the tutorial earlier by creating locks where that ability is the key. For locks, let's introduce garbage piles that block the path, and have them be destructible with the offensive wand ability. This is a lot of effort to go to, when the most straightforward approach would actually be starting the player with every mandatory ability, but there's a lot of benefits to taking a starting skill away. That argument doesn't really fit here, so I'll talk more about that in a bonus section at the end of the video. The remaining mandatory lesson is save point healing, and since it's likely that the player will take a point or two of damage during their first exposure to enemy behavior, we'll try to place save points in between that first enemy exposure and that final combat encounter so that players are healed up before their first taste of combat, and will respawn nearby if it doesn't go so well. Sounds good so far, right? Well, not quite. We've actually introduced a few problems. First, since we've keyed exiting the tutorial area to finding the wand, the player might leave the tutorial before facing that introductory combat. We'll need to stop this by introducing the wand and combat at the same time, so that the combat scenario is the true endpoint of the tutorial and must be resolved to proceed. Second, we haven't actually told the player that the garbage piles can be destroyed. 
we can place some areas that hint at being able to bypass them, like the middle of a thin bridge, but a more proactive way to make sure the player sees this in action is to place these piles all around the introductory combat arena, so that while fighting, you're liable to blow up a few. This design iteration process is all about putting one step into place at a time where it makes the most sense, then looking at the impact of that change and seeing if anything new now needs to be addressed. Since all of your decisions are flowing either from the core design goals you laid out at the beginning or are to solve resulting questions, every action taken to structure the tutorial based on this should be holistically sound. In other words, every decision you've made, big or small, points the player towards the experience you want them to have, whether they know it or not. Let's back up again. These mandatory lessons are feeling pretty good. We've got them laid out like a flowchart, teaching them in an order that makes sense with our design from start to finish. But we shouldn't try to build our map without revisiting the optional concepts again. Remember these? Based on our current flowchart, we'd expect the player to simply move linearly from point to point, but it's going to get a lot more complicated when we introduce our design concepts. Remember, we haven't worked in the sense of exploration yet, and that's meant to be the root of the whole game. Although I applied the same principles we just talked about to build the actual game map in the first place, to explain these wider concepts, it'll be easier to show the final version, so it's time to jump ahead to the implementation of all these ideas in the actual level. level. Here's the tutorial map again. Let's go through what we've already talked about. First, here's the player's starting point and the wand they need to find. Garbage piles here restrict the tutorial area to inside this zone until they've done so. The wand is on an island that is sealed for a combat event when you pick it up, and it's impossible to get to the wand without interacting with enemies a minimum of two times, or by passing by one of two safe points. This is obviously very different from the flowchart we just looked at, so what lessons have been applied here? Most immediately, there's multiple routes to reaching the wand, three dominant routes specifically, with minor variation among them. That part isn't hard to implement, it just requires pointing the player in the right direction should they lose track of where to go. But the whole point is for the tutorial to be invisible. Uh oh. So if we want to guide the player somewhere specific without telling them where, what are our options? First, we can use negative reinforcement to steer the player away from certain areas. Although the player is forced to engage with unthreatening dust motes on the critical path, they are only forced to engage with the more intimidating trash bandits if they stray from the critical path in these three places. If we assume players will avoid these overtly hostile enemies, then the area they're likely to explore becomes restricted like this, almost a perfect match for the critical path. Second, we can reinforce the goal through conversational hints from NPCs. NPCs at these points tell you to check the middle of the swamp by the water, prompting you back south. They'll all encourage you to go find that wand now rather than later. There's actually a trick used in the starting room where the first character you meet tells you the wand is exactly to the right, but you can't actually go right so you'll be forced to travel non-optimally and explore away from where the game points you despite having that goal. Third, you can come across the wand's position before you can get to it by noticing it from the adjacent north or west rooms. Even though our needs require the player to travel further and pass a save point before being able to access the wand, they're much more likely to hone in on that position now that they know where to look. These are all soft barriers, and they don't truly prevent a motivated player from breaking off the critical path to look at something without the wand early. And that's okay. We only want to ensure that players looking for the wand end up finding it. Anyone consciously looking to explore first without it is welcome to. There's only one lesson we haven't touched on yet, so let's make sure that exploration is tangibly rewarded. Rewarding a player can be tricky, because you need to provide rewards that are meaningful. If your game has currency but very little worth buying, then a reward of, say, 100 rupees doesn't mean anything. You can get away with some rewards that are simply for bragging rights, but if you lean too hard on that, it can give players a why bother kind of mentality. That reward doesn't have to be physical, but should always be meaningful relative to how hard it was to find. I've provided a variety of rewards in this tutorial area. The player can find in-game currency as a minor reward, usually found in plain sight or along the main path. Players can also find a conversation with an NPC as a social or lore building reward, with hidden characters having more meaningful things to say, and some NPCs hosting an entire minigame. Some rewards are a small bonus challenge, or a collectible rewarded for completing that challenge. Some rewards are even simple changes to spatial understanding. A player might find a secret path that they then realize they can use to navigate more easily. Despite the critical path being critical, it's still important to place some rewards along it so that it isn't obviously distinct from other screens. The player shouldn't see the path, only unconsciously be drawn to it. But rewards do tend to be better the further you venture off-road. Not all of these rewards are actually obtainable at the start of the game. Some of them are visible but not obtainable, and others are behind garbage pile locks. Showing that there are other things to get or places to go creates a mental to-do list for the player that might get them thinking about where to revisit the next time they get a new ability. We've covered a lot here, but there's actually one more lesson to add to the plan. I keep mentioning things being hidden or secret, but the player hasn't actually been taught that there are secrets in the game, 
Without creating that mentality, most of your hard work will be missed. Since we're trying to keep our tutorial invisible, the only way to teach that there are secrets are to make sure that players find some through level design trickery. I'll wrap this up with just one example to demonstrate. This screen has a hidden snake character who offers a unique trade. When you enter the screen, there's almost no visible indication that the character is hidden here, but every player still finds them. Here's the outline of an invisible collider. When the player walks through this collider, the snake will whisper psst with the dialogue box originating from somewhere in the walls. Although the moment feels organic, it's almost impossible for players to not prompt this text box. The collider overlaps this area here, where the player must cross to be able to proceed from the bottom to the right, as well as this area here, where the player is very likely to step in to open this reward mailbox. The mailbox only has a tiny amount of in-game currency, and is just used as a lure to get the player to walk into the collider. Although I'm all but shouting that there's a secret hidden, the fact that the player has the agency to go try and figure out where the voice is coming from maintains their control over the situation. It makes it still feel like they found it rather than like I told them to look. So that was a lot of information to cover. Let's do a quick recap of everything we did here. First, we taught the mandatory lessons about the combat system by ensuring the player had to interact with that system in certain ways before they could leave the tutorial area. Second, we broke up the critical path into a larger, non-linear area so that the player could explore however we wanted, and then use negative reinforcement to steer them to where we wanted them to go. Third, we laced things worth finding all across the map, and created situations to show the player just how much there was to discover that they might not have noticed at first blush. With all of these steps in place, any player that leaves the tutorial should have a competent grasp of the basics of combat, a real sense of having explored and discovered everything on their own, and a mental to-do list of other things to go see next, now that they're fully equipped, all without the designer having to show their hand. Of course, your level design isn't going to nail it on the first try. This map still has some overdue improvements, and I've gone through a lot of iterations already to make sure each lesson was being taught successfully. But by having every level decision stem from my initial design goals, I'm confident that new players will get that same sense of exploration and agency no matter which way they go. Thanks for watching! Scrapdackle is on Kickstarter right now until April 14th and is currently 140% funded. If you're interested in trying the demo and taking a look at the level design for yourself, the links are below in the description. I haven't made a devlog like this before, so please let me know in the comments if you found it interesting and if it'd be worth making another. Until then, I'd appreciate if you liked and shared this video, and I've got some bonus content for sticking around. Thanks. Okay, here's the last few things I wanted to talk through that didn't fit anywhere else. In Link's Awakening, you have this locked tutorial area that extends from the starting village to the nearby beach. Your first plot objective is in this forest, but you can't enter it yet because you need your sword to cut down some bushes in the way, and your sword is down here on the beach. This is a pretty classic setup, and for good reason, because for this type of game, it's really effective at conducting information to the player organically, meaning the player can learn the gameplay design philosophy without having to be outright stopped and told it. In a top-down game like this where you can explore pretty broadly, players need a little bit of time to get their bearings. Being told that you don't actually have everything you need to proceed allows players to feel comfortable looking around, without having to feel guilty or like there's something they should be doing instead of exploring. So that's benefit number one. Knowing you don't have what you need creates freedom to act non-optimally. You also get the benefit of improved pacing, as the elements of your tutorial are spaced out rather than being bunched in together all at the start, and the player gets to feel a sense of meaningful progression. Link's Awakening is actually doing the same thing we talked about before. In order to make sure you understand how to use the defensive shield, you're not allowed to pick up the offensive sword until you've demonstrated you can use the shield to bypass these spiky creatures. Players will also start creating their mental to-do list during this initial process. You'll almost certainly pass by the forest entrance before getting the sword, and will likely pass the first dungeon at some point as well. Once you have the sword, you'll be thinking about that bush blocking the forest, and when you find the dungeon key in the woods, you'll likely already know where to take it. Think about the differences between this approach and the alternative of having you start with your sword and not needing to go to the beach. You'll need to have more tutorializing at the start of the game prior to actually being allowed to go explore. It may not feel like you should be exploring further if characters are telling you to go to the forest. Without that time to build a to-do list, the player might go right into the forest without ever seeing the beach, and wouldn't know there's a dungeon on the south shore matching the key they just found. And they wouldn't get that sense of progression that comes from seeing something like a blocked forest entrance, and then remembering to go back there with the right tool. There's nothing explicitly wrong with this approach, but from a pacing perspective, there's a lot of benefits to separating out these core tutorial lessons at the start of a game, and there's a lot of reasons Link's Awakening is remembered as a classic. Thanks again. This has been How to Create Invisible Tutorials Through Well-Considered Level Design.